so this um, this talk today is part of a series of talks that we are hosting um, and having to do with cold water fisheries and um, we had return of river herring, we had the removal of the Quinnipoxit dam and coming up, uh, we'll also be having talks on mussels and uh, dam removals um, on in the Nisitissit River watershed. And also mm -hmm. on um, Thursday, May 13th, we're going to have Rebecca Quinones, who's uh, talking about cold water climate refugia. And that has to do a little bit with um, Natural River Watershed Association's project to install um, temperature loggers to see, um, do, to do some kind of a study on temperatures and where fish may be migrating with increased temperatures um, as the temperatures increase two degrees, four degrees, six degrees, et cetera. So please join us for these programs. They're, they're all going to be really interesting, I'm, I'm sure. Our next, um, next networking breakfast is due to be May 18th. And as of now, um, we don't have a topic for that particular day. Mm -hmm. um, so Al Futterman and, and Emma and I will be talking about what might be coming up after that. And I do have to say quickly that this um, series is sponsored by Mass Environmental Trust and they are funded, they fund our projects like the temperature logger project and these series of talks through their whale plates. So you can get those for your, for your car. It's always fun to have. So thank you for that. And I also want to introduce our speakers for today. So we have three people who are going to be talking about Suckerbrook Restoration Project, the dam removal and culvert replacement on Suckerbrook to um, restore continuity, river continuity on Suckerbrook and to the Nisitissit River. So we have, uh, I will start with Michael Rosser of the Squanatissit chapter of Trout Unlimited. Thanks for joining us, Michael. He has been a mover and shaker in Pepperell, um, all things to do with uh, dam removals. So starting with the Millie Turner Dam and, and now the, the uh, Suckerbrook uh, Kai's Parker uh, Dam removal. And um, we also have uh, Paula Tarassi, who's a conservation administrator for the town of Pepperell. I don't think she requires a lot of introduction for most of you people. She's busier than a one-armed paper hanger these days. And um, so I think Paula will be kicking it off. But I also want to introduce uh, Joseph Gould, who's a restoration specialist with uh, the Division of Ecological Restoration in the Division of Fish and Game. Um, Joe's been at DER for two years and he works in the dam removal program and manages a handful of priority projects. Um, prior to that, he was working for six years as the director of ecological programs at Buffalo um, Niagara Waterkeeper. And Joe has a BS and an MS from SUNY Buffalo, the last of which was in science hydrology and environmental studies. So thank you and welcome all three of you. I'll let you get started. I'm gonna mute myself. Okay, well, thank you, Martha. And thank you, Emma, for the introductions. And thank you, Joseph Gould, for allowing me to take part in this presentation today. And for Michael Rosser, you know, these projects happen because of partnerships and they're incredible partnerships. And we can't do it without people. Um, can we bring up the presentation, please? Oh. We have an owl. Excellent, excellent. So before I get into the next slide, this is the project. The project at Kai's Parker Conservation Area is a dam removal, which is the first picture. And then the next one shows the culvert. And you can see the impoundment that's been caused by these you know, man-made um, barriers, basically. And the, this is what's causing the issues in, our, in you know, so many of our cold water fisheries. Um, but there's these projects are so critical and they're so important to the health of our waterways. And we look at Sucker Brook and we have this project going on as well as a um, culvert um, on Heel Street on Sucker Brook. So it's three barriers within the stream that we're working on together. 
But, um, you know, Sucker Brook, why Sucker Brook? I will tell you it's a, it's a, a tributary of the Nisitissa River. And many of you on this call were involved in the uh, Millie Turner Dam project, which is, um, of course, Sucker Brook's a tributary of the Nisitissa River, but they were involved in the Turner Dam removal project back in 2015. And that, you know, that helped to restore stream continuity on the Nisitissa River, and it also removed a public safety threat. Um, but it's projects like this um, that are so important for all of us. And what happens is, is that what we do is we rely on DER um, and we look at and we look at important places in our streams. And Sucker Brook is a cold water fishery. It's a tributary of the Nisitissa River, an outstanding resource water. It's part of the Squanasset area of critical environmental concern. It also is a um, it supplies water. It's the source of our municipal water supply. And it also supports native brook trout, which is why a lot of times, you know, the Squanatus chapter and Trout Unlimited support these, pro, uh, these programs and, you know, support us with, through, through all these projects. And there are three, you know, three rare species of mussels that have been studied in the Nisitis River and Sucker Brook. Um, and you're going to hear more about that in a future presentation. And it's also home to wood turtles, which is a species of special concern in Massachusetts. Um, and I, I guess we can go to the next slide because I do want to recognize the partners. And you can see it's the town working with the Division of Ecological Restorations who was providing technical support and as well as um, funding, working also with the town and the Squanatissa chapter of Trout Unlimited. These projects don't happen without these partnerships. And we also rely on like natural heritage and endangered species because of the wood turtles, because of the rare mussel species, because of the work that's gone into it and fish and wildlife because of, you know, the, the, the brook trout and Nashua River watershed has put data loggers in parts of these streams. They've also done evaluations on culverts within many of our communities. So this data that's collected and um, by the Nashua River watershed and, as well as DER is part of the, um, has been added to the North Atlantic Aquatic Connectivity Collaborative website. So, you know, sizing these culverts for future rain events and things like that is so critical. Um, but I'll go back to like, how do these projects happen? And like with the Turner Dam, that became a priority project. For this project, it also became a priority project. And back in 2010, it started with a, um, a uh, reconnaissance study to evaluate and I, you know, kind of evaluate the whole site and identify like an opinion of probable cost of what it would cost like to take out the dam and to look at this project as a whole. And then in 2018, representatives from Trout Unlimited came before the commission with um, Fish and Wildlife and MassDER, and that's the commission to, because it's kind of careful conservation land for permission to begin the study to remove this dam and replace the culvert. And then in 2019, we were given priority status um, by DEI, we were awarded priority status, which, you know, like I said, it's technical assistance and funding. And all of these projects, every one of them, we look at from a conservation standpoint, I'm looking at, you know, one of my hats is conservation. I look at Suckerbrook, I look at the crossings and the barriers and the pit impacts on fishes, the fishes, the wildlife, water quality, and stream connectivity. And every crossing and every barrier. It has an impoundment and it's a cold water fishery with temperatures rising to as much as 84 degrees. It gets to be a problem for the animals and the, all of the wildlife that re rely on these cold water fisheries. And these perch culverts and these man-made structures, we're not, we can't, wildlife movement is, is reduced or almost, it just doesn't, it's just not happening. But from a um, DPW standpoint, I also work for the DPW and we do a lot of culvert evaluations and a lot of culvert work. When we take out a culvert, we look at what's, you know, what is climate change? What about climate resiliency? We have to consider these things for the future because it's so critical for, we understand the ecological benefits for connectivity, but we also have to make sure when we, we address, to make sure we're not going to be dealing, continue dealing with flooding of our roadways. So all of this is done is within the evaluation process of every time we're doing one of these projects. And we do, you know, climate change is making an impact. We're seeing storms, you know, they might be short rainfall, periods of rainfall, but when the rain comes down, 
and these culverts back up and woody debris doesn't pass. You know, we, these are undersized culverts and this is where we have problems. And then we end up with public safety issues. So, you know, and it's a constant um, effort on behalf of the DPW, the highway department, going out knowing they've got to go to certain locations and we have these events to make sure the roads aren't flooded. So by doing these projects and doing them correctly, you know, the correct design and engineering and working with groups like we, we're working with, um, with um, Horsley Witten is the engineering firm, um, but we, you know, we can't do it without all, everybody working together. Like Neshoba Conservation Trust and Mississippi River Land Trust. I mean, there'll be, we'll be moved translocating muscles. We'll be, you know, it just, it's a study of um, looking at the whole um, stream temperature before and after. So I don't wanna continue talking too much, but I do wanna, I just wanna stress the importance of our partnerships, but I also wanna stress the importance of, you know, this whole connectivity within the stream and, you know, keeping our streams clean um, because we know the stresses that development and everything else has on these streams. But in we making these connections, every step, every time we have an opportunity, we're taking it and we're working with DEI, we're working with Trout Unlimited. I mean, you, these partners are incredible parts of this, these whole projects and they wouldn't happen without these, without all the partnerships. And you know the town can't be more appreciative and everybody plays a little part. Some people play a bigger part, but everybody working together is what makes these projects happen. So I wanna introduce jo Joseph Gould, who will be speaking next and he'll talk a little bit more about the project, but um, I'm just honored to be working with this group of people. I mean, I couldn't be happier. Thank you. Thanks Paula, I appreciate that. Sorry, Paula, do you want to mute? Thanks, Paula, I appreciate that introduction. And I um, would like to reiterate uh, the partnerships, the key partners you see here in the support is critical for um, these projects to get done. And, and without them, really, these projects never get off the ground, as Paula was mentioning. Um, with that, I, I guess I would like to also rec like to recognize uh, Squanatis at TU Chapter, Michael Rossi, Rosser. Um, I think at the end, maybe Michael, if you want to just say a few things, uh, we'll get the presentation underway, but uh, we'll give you that opportunity at the end if that's okay. Um, I will like to also go back really quick to the first slide to just show um, just the project. The slide, uh, the picture on the left is the dam removal that we're going to be talking about today. And then the two pictures on the right are the culvert as well as the beaver deceiver that we'll talk a little bit more about just to give that image as you we kind of go through the conversation so you can see what we're talking about today. I know most of you are familiar with uh, Case Parker, Case Parker, but I um, just want to show those real quick. Um, some of the topics we'll be covering today are DR and priority projects and really what is our role. Um, dam removal is a restoration practice and what to expect. And then we'll talk about Sucker Brook as the, um, the continuity restoration project, uh, Case Parker. Um, why is the project important? Um, talk generally about timeline and costs. Uh, work we've done, as well as next steps in construction and proposed monitoring. DR priority projects, um, they're evaluated competitively, uh, semi-annually, and the key things we really look for is the ecological and community benefits. Uh, Paula mentioned a lot of these, but um, you know, in this case, we're really looking at the resiliency aspects that we can uh, provide for uh, infrastructure, as well as the ecological benefits we can provide to the stream. After all, we're the mission of ecological restoration, so we are really focused on the the ecological components of this project that we'll talk a little more about. Uh, we're also the level of support from owners and partners. Um, I think you already heard a lot about this. It's really, really important for us for these projects. And then overall feasibility of the projects. You know, while we see a lot of projects coming to DER, some of them are just not feasible um, at the time. Sometimes they take time to develop. Um, so we really try to assess that and uh, get an understanding of what is the feasibility at the moment we take these on as priority projects. And um, the reason why is DR really sees ourselves as a support role, um, as a technical partner. And um, we really provide a lot of technical support through all the various stages of the project, which includes project management, contracting, some of the technical things like uh, going out and data collection and um, the hydraulic modeling and stuff that's done by the engineer and really getting through a lot of the permits. Um, there's, as you see a little bit later in this presentation, there's a lot of permits that go into these projects, a lot of regulatory uh, aspects that are, need to be considered. Um, so that's really what DR's role is to help navigate some of those things and also provide funding, especially in that earlier on phase, seed funding to 
get these projects off the ground, really get through some of those early design and um, data collection and um, phases. Um, all obviously in uh, support of the partners and the owner. Um, the type of projects that we do, you'll hear me talking mostly about dam removal today and culvert replacement. Um, but DR also works on cranberry bog projects, coastal freshwater wetlands, uh, stream flow, urban river revitalization. So we work on a lot of different projects um, and restoration practices that uh, we're happy to talk to you more about some other time, but I just wanted to mention those that uh, we do work on a lot of different things and think about the different aspects in which we're looking at these uh, stream quarters and um, the different parts of Massachusetts that we're working in. So really, I think Paul also hit on this point too, is really like the build on success. And in this case, I think this project in a lot of ways is a continuation of the Nisitisit work that was done at the Millie Turner Dam. Uh, some of my former, or some of my colleagues uh, formerly worked with uh, Paula and Michael and other folks uh, from the town, so as the partners mentioned, to really get that project done. And uh, Nisitista was a great example of um, working together to remove that dam, but also really look at the, the mussels and the trout um, that are there. And some of that work actually is what we're continuing through with this project. I'll talk a little bit about with the mussels work and other things like that. So it's really building on that success and that watershed um, approach. Um, I just want to show you a quick slide of the DER priority projects. We are working all across Massachusetts. Um, you see we do a lot of work on the coast, but we also work inland. You'll see some projects up here in areas of Neckley Woods. Uh, this includes the Millie Turner as well as Sucker Brook, and then a few other dam removals and other cover projects that we're working on um, with partners and towns. So dam removal is a restoration practice. These are the US figures um, from our uh, partners at American Rivers. They just recently gave these to us. These are the 2020 figures. Um, I think the reason why this is really important to show is that you'll see that dam removal has been gaining support over the last 10 to 20 years, but um, which is great, but it's really happening a lot less than we need. Um, I think if you look at the, the left margin, this is dam removals per year and the darker uh, orange line is how many dam removals happen per year. In the last uh, three or four years, we've been seeing in the 80 to 100 range. We kind of peaked out in 2017, 2018, and that came back down. But generally speaking, we see in the last decade or so, 60 to 80 dam removals nationally. Um, just to put it in perspective, there's tens of thousands of dams in the U.S. So while it's gaining support and momentum, we haven't really moved the needle as much as we need to. And also an important thing to point out is I know a lot of people talk about hydropower. Um, I would say we, we can comfortably say that less than 10% of these dams in the US are actual hydropower FERC dams, federally energy, energy regulated dams. So I guess what you'd say is a lot of these dams, as you'll see in the next slide, including mass are um, dams that are just old um, dams that have been around for you know, centuries. So the cumulative dams that have been moved in the United States over the last uh, century are roughly about 1,700 dams total. These are the dams in Massachusetts. You'll see there's a lot of red on the screen. Um, in Massachusetts, we have over 3,000 dams um, that are mapped. There's more that we find in the woods, uh, small little dams, um, but there's over 3,000. So the ecological impacts of dams is widespread. Uh, just to put that in perspective of what we've moved, removed so far, DER has been in, um, in, um, involved about 50 dam removals. In total, Massachusetts, we've removed about 65 dams, uh, a little over 65 dams. Last year, we had a pretty good year, removed six dams uh, across the state of Massachusetts. Uh, DER has been working to accelerate this with partners, but I think one of the things I have to hammer home here is that, again, this partnership theme without partners, without towns, municipalities, uh, folks like Squanatissa TU, really bringing these projects forward, um, we wouldn't get this many dams done and we need more people to do that. So it's a really important thing to kind of spread the word on. Um, we are starting to move the needle Massachusetts, but there's a lot more work to be done, especially in the light of climate change and other things like that. So these are the dam removal projects uh, that we've done in Massachusetts. And they're kind of broken out by category, but it gives you a good idea of the representation that we see in the mass uh, across Massachusetts. And um, we've done, like I said, about 65 dams, as well as you see a bunch of the ones in green that are active dams removals that we're currently working on. So 
I think it's important to take a look at this. I actually stole this slide from a colleague of mine, Alex Hackman. Uh, it's a conceptual river recovery model. And it's important for people to understand what happens when you remove a dam. And it's, it's really helpful to see the ecological conditions and how they improve over time. And this, this uh, slide really tells that story in two different ways, the downstream reach as well as the impoundment in the upstream area. And they're impacted differently by dams. Um, it's just important to understand that because um, oftentimes people go out and they'll see the dam and impoundment and they think it's pretty. And then downstream, there's this really kind of aesthetically often cobble stream that um, looks really pretty, but it's often starved of sediment. So really you kind of have two different stories at the dam, one upstream with a lot of sediment behind the dam and then downstream uh, kind of a sediment starved reach. What we see is that oftentimes the ecological conditions uh, in the downstream reaches, which is the data line, are mixed. Um, you know, we usually have a decent uh, ecological conditions, but there is usually some warming impacts from the street or from the impoundment in the stream itself. Um, once again, the sediment starved system, sometimes you'll see uh, excess erosion and stuff like that, excessive erosion because of those things. Uh, but overall, the ecological health is usually decent. Um, in cold water fisheries, we do see some impacts to, you know, trout and other things and mussels. The conditions in the dam, while often aesthetically appealing, are often poor. Um, and this is because you see a lot of warming of the water. The water quality is pretty poor, especially after these dams have been in for decades and decades. And so while you see ducks and other things, the actual ecological conditions of those impoundments are often pretty poor. What happens at dam removal is interesting. You see these lines cross. Those conditions in the upstream area increase pretty rapidly once we remove the dam. You see the impoundment reform, the stream channel reform pretty quickly, and we see ecological conditions improve pretty quickly. Those streams uh, will recut themselves sometimes in days, if not weeks. So over the first six to 18 months, we see a really uh, pretty rapid increase in ecological conditions in the, in the impoundment and the upstream reaches. Conversely, downstream, we often see a, a negative impact in the short term. And I guess this is really important for people to understand, and this is important we talk to people about, and that's because we see the sediment move through the system. We're basically, especially with passive release, we're basically letting a lot of sediment that's been blocking up over decades, if not centuries, through that system. And while we see this short-term negative impact, it only takes usually about six to eight months or so, sometimes a little bit longer, depending on storms, to clear out and start clearing out, and you see this ecological uplift in the actually downstream areas. Um, as a result of the dam removal. And then over about 18 months or so, you really see this overall condition improve post dam removal. So short-term impacts, but long-term gains, really. I think that's the story to tell. And our folks that uh, in the other agencies realize this too, actually for Sucker Brook, they gave us a time of year restriction uh, waiver because they saw the impacts uh, of the dam removal is so short term that it overall would benefit the trout long term. And that's why partners at Squanticity TU and uh, Pepperell and other folks, as well as all the partners that are mentioned, are really behind in supporting this project. This slide is just a quick aerial showing what you expect to see in an impoundment pre and post dam removal. This is one of the DR's dam removals that happened uh, three or four years ago. The photo on the left is obviously the dam and impoundment in. And then the photo on the right is really less than six months later, you see the stream re can, um, reform and you see the sediment uh, that was in the impoundment. We don't release all the sediment downstream. It's important to realize that, you know, a lot of the sediment actually stays in place and revegetates and um, it really reforms that kind of floodplain area that over time actually, you know, starts to get trees and other things. Um, what we really like to see here is that on the, the right, you see that it starts to resemble the stream channel, which you see upstream and downstream of where this impoundment was. And that happens pretty quickly. So I think this is just a good aerial that shows you that. I'm gonna show you a chain sequence here. And this is a, a dam removal that DER worked on, Alice Hackman and uh, Nick Wildman um, about five or six years ago. And it really resembles what we think we're gonna see at Sucker Brook. You see this impoundment, it's similar to what you would see as you see at um, Kays, Kays Parker. It's a tree line impoundment, long linear impoundment, um, pretty filled in with sediment. And you'll see how it changes over one or two growing seasons. And it's, it's pretty amazing on my mind. So this is uh, with the dam in and uh, just going into the winter. Uh, so late fall, early winter. Next picture, you see we pulled the dam 
and obviously the ice is in there, but you can see where the stream's starting to cut through the center and the, some of the ice is falling in. And you can uh, see the, the impoundment, the, the water kind of coming down, the water level coming down. And you start to see this formation of a stream channel. This is a little bit later in the winter, and you'll see that the stream channel is really starting to set up. You see some of those banks on the sides starting to form. The stream's continuing to cut. The water level has come down. That sediment that I was talking about in the previous slide is really starting to set up, and it's starting to dry out a little bit, even though it's winter, and it's starting to form a more solid uh, substrate area on the sides. So what was in that center channel has kind of moved downstream. That's the short-term impacts I mentioned, but you see this channel continue to form. And now it's springtime, and you see the channel is still continuing to cut. In the spring, we also see these spring flows. You really start to see some of the sediment move out, um, some higher flows cutting, and you see some of the steeper banks that where the stream's cutting because some of those higher flows, we call those stream forming flows. Um, usually they're the two year uh, storm events and stuff. So you also see the sediment um, that I mentioned, it's starting to veg up and really kind of stabilize in place. So this continues. Next slide, a little later in spring, a lot of vegetation. Those banks are getting a little bit more gradual sloped, and you're seeing a really nice uh, stream channel forming. There is some sediment. It doesn't look super pretty um, that it's kind of piling up here. But one of the things, if you walked up this stream channel, you'll notice that you're starting to see that cobbly, gravelly substrate again. And this is really only about three, four months after dam removal, um, pushing in the six-month range. So you start to see that cobbly, gravelly substrate that trout and other species like to see mixed in with sediment and sand. A little bit later in the summer, vegging up, continuing, um, and just lighter, gentler slope banks. Everything's starting to settle. The, deep, the sediment in this impoundment starts to, be, to compress, and the water continues to leach out, and um, we really start to see the really nice form of the channel. And this is the fall. So this is really over about a growing season or so, um, how this impoundment has changed over that time period. And I'll just run through it really quick in uh, kind of full speed. And once again, this is over a little less than a year. Dam out, ice, forming channel, sediment uh, moving through, uh, channel really forming, starting to veg, veg out pretty nicely, channels forming up. This is when you start to get a really nice, more defined low flow channel, warmer summer months, and then fall. So I want to show you all that, but I, the, obviously the the point of this talk is really to talk to you about the Case Parker project, the Sucker Brook project. And to start out with, I just wanted to kind of highlight the key features of this project. So it gives you a kind of sense of what we're talking about as we walk through. I know a lot of folks are familiar with Kais Parker, but uh, really quick, uh, Oak Hill Street culvert, and this is where the access road um, comes in. Can you give folks, can you see my uh, pointer? Martha, can you give me a thumbs up if so? Can you see my mouse? Okay. Um, so this is the Oak Hill Street culvert. This is the access road. This is the access road culvert we're we talking about that we're going to be replacing. This is a large beaver dam in the middle of an impoundment that has been the topic of a lot of discussions. Um, Michael or Paula can obviously fill you in on those. Um, the flow of the stream obviously going down towards the Nisitisset. And then this is the impoundment itself. And then the stone dam that we're going to be removing um, this fall one way or another, right, um, is right here at the top of the screen. So why is this project important? Um, Paula talks a little about the infrastructure and what they're really looking at in the watershed and all that stuff like that. But I think it's important to talk about the wildlife here. There's a lot of critical wildlife. And um, you folks who live up here know this already. You live in a really cool spot in Massachusetts. I've actually kind of fallen in love with pepperell. You'll see me there next. Uh, on Thursday, actually, I'll be out there with Paul and Michael, but I'll be there bright and early to go look for bobcats and other things like that. Um, the critical wildlife that we see in Sucker Brook is really um, one of the reasons why this project is so appealing. Um, obviously, the brook trout are, you know, a really key uh, focus um, in this cold water fishery. Um, they move up in the system for refuge, and uh, it's really important uh, species that we're seeing a lot of loss uh, across Massachusetts and the Northeast. So this is really important that we remove these dams, help restore these streams so that they have uh, uh, basically habitat to live in and uh, this cold water refuge. Uh, the the mussel species that uh, Paul mentioned about 
um, within this statistic as well as in Sucker Brook that we have is Brook Floater, Triangle Floater, and Creeper. I think you guys can hear another talk on this. We won't get into too many details here, but these are some state listed species, especially the Brook Floater and Triangle Floater. Creeper has been delisted, but um, really, really important stuff. And we're going to be doing a lot of monitoring to protect these species. Um, and also we're we'll doing some uh, moving of these species down to the nest tissue that I'll talk a little more about. Wood turtle is another important species uh, here. And thanks to Paula, who's uh, somewhat of a turtle expert, uh, we will be doing uh, management of wood turtle on the site to make sure we don't impact them as all, um, at all. And she actually got approved by National Endangered Species Program to do this. So we're really grateful for her help on that. An interesting story as well is American eel. Um, recently, we've been told by our colleagues at Fishburg State that they've actually sampled American eel at the mouth of Sucker Brook. Um, the reason why this is really exciting for us is because uh, we look back through the DFG's records, uh, Department of Fish Games records, on they haven't sampled American eel. So we do think that the, this is a story that is going to be played out over the next year or so, and it should be really interesting to see if American eel are getting up into Sucker Brook and if they maybe get up further now after this dam removal and culvert replacement project. So. Kind of exciting, neat stuff, something I'm sure we'll hear play out over the next couple of years. Um, this, this slide's kind of confusing, but uh, I'll just highlight the key major um, things uh, from the project timeline. Everybody wants to know how these projects happen, what's the timeline, what's it take? So basically in summary, uh, the 40, 75%, 100% designs, the design features usually take 18 to 24 months once we take it on as a priority project and start working with the, um, the partners, uh, the town and other partners. Um, that happens over the 18 to 24 months. So concurrently, once we get to the 40% design, we also start working on permitting. Permitting takes some time. We all wish it did, but um, there's a lot of regulatory framework to protect these uh, areas that we need to get through. So that takes about 12 to 18 months as well. Um, we start that concurrently once we get past the 40% designs, enough to really show those regulatory agencies what we're going to be doing and working on. We also then start working on uh, <clears throat> fundraising as well. And then once we get through all that stuff, there's obviously the construction phase. So for Sucker Brook, this is the Sucker Brook timeline. Construction for the dam removal, we plan to do this fall. If funding comes into place, we hope to do the culvert as well. If not, we're going to do the culvert in the spring. Um, I... I'm positive we're going to do the dam removal um, this fall because we have such great partners and people who are eager to go out and get this dam removal done. Um, almost, almost already happens. Uh, inside joke there, but uh, we uh, we definitely will get the dam removal done this fall. Um, some of you actually might have been out on the site that day where we're we're about ready to pull this dam. Um, we're really eager to get it done, but we do need to get through some few permits. So the permitting um, right now. Um, we're finishing that up and then so construction this fall and then just we'll be doing post monitoring afterwards. These are the things that you see at the bottom. Some later monitoring will happen. Uh, we'll be doing it actually before the dam removal to get some baseline work and then through on uh, beyond 2022. Um, I include this slide because inevitably somebody always asks me about project costs. Uh, so just in summary, you can look at the details. I'll pause here for a minute. But basically, the design phase, which is everything you see above that red line, costs about $98,000 for a sucker brook. DR supported the lion's share of this effort, but it was also with the support of TU coming with some money in hand, which is really, really important. They had some seed money for this project. They've helped out with some of this stuff, paying for some of those critical things. But their seed money actually is really important for what's below this side, uh, which is um, the construction costs. And we're currently fundraising for some of this stuff, but the construction cost is about between 215 and 265. The minimum probable engineering costs are a little bit um, variable at this stage. We're still we're working on 100% um, designs right now. So we'll tighten this number up a little bit more, but that's a pretty good ballpark of what this is gonna cost. And then about 20K for construction, uh, which is engineering support and bid support. So we have to send this out to bid if um, we don't have the time to do it. Joe, so is that is that um, both for the dam and the culvert? Or yeah. yeah, good question. Thanks, Martha. Um, yeah, so the construction this whole uh, project cost is for both the um, projects, and so the dam rule is actually just to be clear is a pretty inexpensive component of this project, which is kind of interesting. Um, usually, dam rules are um, a little bit more 
costly than this, but it's damn removable because it's so simple. And we're doing it mostly with volunteers, which is great because we're gonna be able to capture a lot of it in kind. It's really not that expensive a component of the project. The bulk of this cost is going into the buying the culvert itself. The culvert itself, um, because we want it sized properly, we want it to be there for a hundred years and you know, um, not have to really have to do with it, deal with this in any of our lifetimes or probably our children's, it's about $90,000 just for the culvert. And we can talk a little bit more about the culvert as we get into design. So hopefully that answered your question, Martha. Um, perfect. So I won't bore people with permits. Um, I've already bored uh, our partners with permits enough, but it is a critical part of every project. Um, and this is one of the things that is DR is the technical um, support. We really help uh, folks get through. There's a lot to do with the dam removal because there's just a lot to consider. MEPA is uh, the first basically start of the regulatory framework. It doesn't actually come up with a permit, but it's the first step in the regulatory process. And we do, and for most dam rules and culverts uh, replacement projects, we do an expanded ecological notification form. Um, and this is really, we attach a lot of information to the traditional ENF. We also, in this case, ask for a waiver of the environmental impact report, um, EIR, and we actually got support from some of the folks on this call for that, um, a lot of letters of support, which were super helpful, and we actually did get a waiver for this project due to basically what I said, there might be some short-term impacts, but really those long-term benefits outweigh them. So. Once again, a lot of support from folks. We were able to get this, and uh, the regulators um, at DP agreed that um, the way this aspect. We also need to get through Chapter 91. In this case, we also need a license because of the culvert, um, but we also need to get through Section 404 Water Quality Cert. We combine these two in what was considered a joint application. And then we're doing uh, Wetlands Protection Act Notice of Intent or Order of Conditions. Um, this is actually going to be going forward in front of the Federal Conservation Commission in early May. Um, I'm sure you'll see some uh, maybe stuff in the local paper about that soon, as well as um, just some other notifications. Um, and that'll be housed at the town. Um, and then we also need to get through Section 404. This is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. This is the federal permit we have to do for a dredge fill permit. These things, uh, the, all these permits we're kind of wrapping up right now um, and uh, getting them in and working on them we'll probably get all them uh, completed in the next uh, few weeks, but um, it usually takes about four to six months to get them all turned around, just so everybody knows. So later this summer, we should have them all in hand. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you a little about sediment management with any dam removal. This is the bulk of any dam removal project. Um, sediment management is one of the huge considerations that we have to look at for any dam removal because um, depending on whether or not it's clean or not and what we're going to do with that and some of the impacts. So. This is the kind of the four key steps. And I have to mention my colleague, Alex Hackman and Nick Wildman down here in the lower right, as well as other colleagues at DR who spent tons and tons of time. And Kristen is on the call, Kristen Fury and other folks, really trying to work through and figure out how to streamline this process. Um, I love Alex there with Dirt Don't Hurt. Um, the bottom line is that we just have to think about uh, sediment and how we're managing it, it, it's not a negative thing, but it's, it's something we really have to consider and think about and carefully plan for. So first step, get to know the site, sediment and setting. So we usually do what we call a due diligence. We dig up all the information we can using desktop analysis, uh, so GIS, other things like that, dig through all the DB files, look at the watershed contacts, where is this dam in, in context of the watershed. Um, that's important because what's, potentially the land use or infrastructure or um, downstream that we might impact, you know, by excess sediment, or is there a lot of industry or other things like that upstream um, or agriculture lands that might impact that, what that sediment quality is. So we can understand all that stuff going in and we can develop a, a sediment management plan. Um, and really is figure out how we're gonna do sediment sampling in the impoundment and upstream to assess the risk. This is the second step assessing sediment related risk. And we look at this, as we mentioned uh, in the due diligence, but this is the set, um, step where we look at it in ecological considerations, as well as infrastructure and flooding, as well as human health and safety. So we really get into some of those. Um, and then we consider different sediment management approaches. Do we mechanically remove it? Can we pass or release it? Is there upland disposal options? Um, in the case of Stucker Brook, we're gonna 
passively release sediment. We're going to release the sediment downstream. Um, the sediment's really clean. We've done sediment sampling and impoundment. You'll see on the bottom of the slide, there's um, these red axes. The three red axes in the impoundment are where we did composite sampling. So we sampled three different places, deposited those, and sent them to a lab to do analysis for a whole suite of chemical. Um, and we can prepare those to human health as well as ecological um, uh, risk assessments, or sorry, um, standards. And then the, the pinkish X with the darker border in upstream and downstream is where we collected those samples really to compare the upstream and downstream um, things. So then we select the sediment uh, preferred approach. And in this case, once again, we basically decided we could release the sediment and we work with DP and we're working through that regulatory framework that I talked in the last slide about to allow for that. Again, there'll be some short-term impacts, but overall, great, great long-term um, value. So I guess real quick before I go on, this picture with my colleague, Nick Wildman, it's kind of small with him in the hat. This is what sediment sampling looks like. Alex has a big uh, probe there in his hand too. And then you see we put it in a bucket, we composite, we bottle this stuff up, we send it off to a lab. We also work with DEP on these sediment management plans um, and we provide them to the town and stuff like that. So happy to talk more about this and have any questions at the end. So this is an existing culvert. You saw the slide before. And I just wanted to show this to you folks again before we get into the plans. This culvert is what we say really undersized. Um, it's a 36 inch diameter pipe. Um, I'll show you later, uh, based on stream crossing standards, this really should be about a 20 foot box culvert. And it's also, as you can see, it's not embedded. It doesn't have natural substrate through it. And we have this beaver deceiver, um, which is the picture on the lower left, as well as you can see the egg cage on the, the downstream end of this, which is a larger picture. Um, this beaver deceiver, especially on the upstream end, which is that picture on the lower left again, is effectively making this culvert actually only about 18 inches. That pipe is only about 18 inches there. And as all this debris jams up onto it, it, it just doesn't allow the capacity that this culvert needs. I think uh, Paul actually said this culvert got a lot of re-jammed up on it a couple weeks ago and it overtopped the road. Yes, it was so, beaver activity. The beaver activity just all of a sudden it happened so quickly and the road was, it was just skimming the road. So this is like inland. It's not even at the road. This is, the, but it goes to show you when it's improperly sized, the impacts that happen. Exactly. Yeah, so that's a great example of like, you know, in the springtime, um, you know, due to beaver activity and some debris jamming up on it, like you can see here, these things can overtop. So this is that resiliency piece that um, is really important for these projects. Obviously, there's the wildlife and ecological concerns, but the resiliency piece that is really important as well is like, how do we make these roads um, and infrastructure so people can go enjoy this conservation area uh, more resilient long term? And this is currently not working that well. Cover plans, nobody likes plan sets uh, besides engineers. Um, this is really a, a confusing slide, but it's important to show, and there's no other really great way to show the, some of the key things and aspects of the cover replacement. So I'm gonna walk through these real quick with you. And um, it's also hard to see on a slide. Usually we have these as huge plan sheets, but you know, unfortunately we're not all able to get together. So I can't show you a uh, you know, three and a half, three foot by two foot plan sheet. Um, the key components of this is water control and the dewatering plan. So what we're going to be doing here, again, you can see my mouse, correct? Okay. Yes. Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, so we're going to be putting in these coffer dams, one upstream, oops, sorry, one upstream and one downstream. And this is so we can work in the dry. We want to be able to replace this culvert. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be diverting flow around through this auxiliary pipe downstream. So we're replacing this culvert in the dry. That way the workers can, um, well, one, it's for sediment, um, so reduce sedimentation going in the stream, but also so these workers can work in the dry and really get this culvert out and set it the way we want to. So that's what these big hatched uh, march, um, their copper dams that are coming into place. And this is a diversion pipe as well as one over here. So that's how we're gonna control the water. We're putting in these uh, pumps, you can see in the bottom left, um, we'll be pumping the water around and uh, working the dry. There is also um, erosion and sediment control. You'll see these are here. We'll be putting a silk curtain in. 
we'll be putting along the which is this the staging area and stuff we'll be putting sediment uh control in which is still socks and other things um as well as it also we'll probably be putting in um fencing to uh, help protect from the turtles from coming in um, and keeping them out of the work areas and stuff. And then the next thing we'll be doing is putting in, um, we'll start to, so this is the access point from Kais Parker. Sorry, everybody, unfortunately, there, when we're doing this, you won't be able to access Kais Parker, um, but we'll be coming in here to the access road, staging everything in here. And we'll be starting to excavate uh, from the left, sorry, the right bank, which is this side, and work our way back, pulling out all this sediment, the culvert, the roadbed, and pulling it all out and excavating down to the depth we need to put in this new bot culvert that's gonna be embedded into the stream channel. So we have a natural stream channel through. And we'll work our way back to the left bank, which is over here. And then we'll be putting in a 20 foot box culvert, a large concrete box culvert. We'll be bedding that into the uh, substrate about two feet and, um, I'll show you that in the next picture. So this is the culvert plans continued. This is really helpful. You're looking basically upstream at this culvert, what it's going to look like. And um, it's 20 feet wide. And what you see, this is the top of the roadbed. These are the wing walls. And right here on the both sides, so this will be coming out, uh, concrete ring walls. And you'll be seeing natural stream substrate to the bottom of this culvert. And the culvert bottom will be two feet below the bed. Um, it'll also, once again, be 20 foot wide, so you'll have some cobble and substrate um, along the sides, so dry passage and um, allow for amphibians and other things to pass by here, which is really important, especially on um, municipal roads. This one, not so much. People aren't flying down this road. It's obviously an access road, but it'll allow for that dry passage for turtles and other things, and I have to go up over top. <clears throat> so quickly, this is what the big box cover looks like. Um, we'll be picking this up and setting it in. And uh, again, 20 feet, this one's only 10 feet, but you get the gist and the substrate will be coming up to, you know, here. Other thing that's important is the openness ratio. We'll be doing um, a six foot tall box culvert so that we have enough openness so it can pass some of that larger debris and other things like that. And also the beavers hopefully won't jam this thing up. You know, you got a big wide culvert, good openness ratio. Um, you're gonna be able to pass all that debris in the spring and it won't be hopefully an issue for the um, road anymore. Um, beavers are industrial creatures. I can't pr promise the beavers won't ever dam this thing up, um, but all other debris flow and everything like that should be good. Um, and then in the bottom right, you'll see, why do we pick a 20 foot culvert? Some people are like, are you kidding me? This is huge for an access road. The reason why is we've taken measurements upstream and downstream. And if you look, this red right, right area is painted towards the bank and the bank full widths that we took on average are 16 feet upstream and downstream of this. Uh, we took five or six downstream bank full widths and a couple upstream where we could in reference reaches further upstream and about 16 feet is the average bank full width. So if you do uh, times that by 1.2, which is the Massachusetts stream crossing standards, we end up with 19.2. And so we end up with a 20 foot culvert. They don't make them 19.2, um, they make them the round sizes. So that's why we're putting in such a big culvert. This, um, yeah. I know I'm getting a little bit uh, close on time, so I'll kind of move this along a little bit more. But this is the dam removal. As I said, this is actually the easier part of the project. Um, what we plan on doing, and this is going to happen this fall, is we plan on coming down the access road with a small mini excavator, um, most likely provided with the town um, through partnership with them, and with a bunch of volunteers. Everybody, if you want to volunteer, contact Michael Rosser um, and uh, get down here. And we have some very ambitious volunteers from TU that are going to come in and pull a lot of this rock out. The reason why we have the, the excavator is some of the larger rock um, we will need to pull out with the excavator so we don't break each other's backs. Um, but uh, we're going to access it, like I said, down the access road. We're going to come across this little bridge. This is the little staging area over here. This is where the dam is. And we're just going to pull out these stones one at a time and kind of slowly let the dam um, draw down, let the pavement and some of that sediment to settle up and kind of, so we don't release a lot downstream because we're only hoping to release, there's about 4,500 cubic yards of sediment in this impoundment. We're only planning on releasing about 700 cubic yards total. Um, may sound like a lot, but it, the stream like this can handle it. Um, so we'll pull all this stuff out. We'll be reusing it, all of it on site. 
We'll be sticking some in this channel. We'll also be putting some in the, the culvert that I just showed you to create that nice cobbly gravelly substrate in some of the larger rock that we'll use up there. And um, we're removing this dam this fall and it'll allow them to see uh, this impoundment to longer. It'll be drained and will allow for a more natural stream channel to cut through this. There's uh, some uh, cross sections down here. Really, you can see what the soft sediment, what the cut is gonna look like. Um, and then we're also, there's some tree protection and stuff like that up on the right. That's what those details are. Just wanna show you what the dam looks like. Um, this picture on the top is a little blurry, but we removed a lot of this, actually I should say TU and uh, volunteers removed a lot of this debris um, that's already on there. So now it's just more rock. They pulled it off uh, and we're gonna be pulling these rocks out um, later this fall. This is obviously the impoundment. Once again, it looked a lot like that one we saw earlier in that whole progression where we saw the aerial and then we saw the progression as it, the impoundment drained over you know, a course of a year or so. So we, I really think it's really comparable to that example and it's gonna cut a stream channel. We're probably thinking somewhere, we did some probing and other things somewhere around this side cut down through and connect into um, the downstream reaches. Um, <clears throat> wrapping things up, I just wanna talk a little about monitoring protection. Uh, again, I talked about that key wildlife, but what we need to do for that is we're working with our partners, uh, Natural Religion Endangered Species Program, uh, Mass Wildlife, uh, Paula with the Town Conservation Commission. I know Emily um, will also be joining us. She has done a lot of muscles work. Um, TU will be out there helping with some of the monitoring of fish, uh, so brook trout and other things. Also temperature monitoring. We will be doing uh, turtle protection and we'll be doing sediment monitoring, photo monitoring, a lot of monitoring work after this. Prior to um, the dam removal, we'll be doing uh, a round of fish uh, sampling with our partners at DFG and um, TU and other folks will probably be out there for that. And then we also, because we want to get a baseline study, as I mentioned, but we'll also be moving mussels. This is actually pictures of the Nisitisset. I was out with Michael this past summer and they were snorkeling around uh, the Nisitisset. And um, we'll, they were actually assessing um, how these mussels are recovering. We'll be collecting the mussels uh, just below Sucker Brook Dam and we'll be tagging them and moving them down to the Nisitisset. Um, and then we'll be monitoring them for four or five years afterwards. So that's some of the monitoring efforts that are gonna be happening um, this summer, next fall, um, in the fall, and the next couple of years after that. I'm gonna wrap it up there. So we have a little time for question and answers. Um, again, thank you so much to the partners. Thank you to Martha. Really appreciate you giving me the time this morning and everybody else joining. Um, I'm gonna kick it over to you, Martha. Do you want me to exit out of the screen or anything like that? Um, why don't you just hold on in case somebody wants to go back to a, a picture? Um, uh, just for a few minutes, but thank you very much for that, uh, Joe. That was that was great, and it's really exciting to know that the dam's going to come out this year, come hell or high, high water, right? <laughs> it's going to come out. <laughs> so um, that's fabulous, and uh, you know, asking for for volunteers, that's that's great. Um, and more information is coming out in the next couple of weeks if people want to learn more about the mussels and the work that's been done in the Nisitisset. Um, on May 6th and then May 20, uh, April 27th, there's going to be a couple of women talking about their work, uh, PhD work in um, the area about mussels and, and dam removals. So uh, stay tuned for that. But thank you so much. And um, any questions from anybody? I know there was one comment from Rebecca Longval about the, the eels. It's very cool about the eels, <laughs> hearing about them. So uh, I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Michael. Um, yeah, so I just, I just uh, get my video on here. It doesn't make a difference. Um, well, for, first of all, that was fascinating. And, and it was, um, uh, I was really impressed by how much care is really being taken and how much planning has got into this. Really, really, really impressive. But Joe, at the end there, you mentioned about removing uh, some of those endangered mussels, tagging them and putting them into the Nisitisset River. Are there plans to move them back to the Sucker Brook eventually? No, there's not. Um, so just to be clear, um, we're gonna be moving the endangered mussel species. Um, and uh, we really rely on our mussel experts at Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program to develop those plans. We help develop the plan, but um, basically the plan is to move all the endangered mussel species as many as possible down to the Mississippi. 
that being said, I should be clear, they often, they, they even say, you know, most of the time when they're doing these muscle moving programs, they only usually get 50, 60% of the muscles. Um, they move as many as they can, so they obviously, obviously don't impact them, but they also are not moving the less, like the more ubiquitous muscles. They want to see how those are react to the sediment. It's something that we just don't know a lot about. So no, there's not. We're hoping due to now the new connectivity that those muscles will work their way back up in after this dam um, and the stream settles out. That's the plan. Yep. Uh, uh, it, it just just quick follow up. So um, you know, I know the muscles can uh, can transport upstream. You know, in the sort of the larval stage when they're attached to the gills of fish. Are, mm -hmm. are there any of these um, muscles that uh, endangered muscles that have been documented upstream? Anywhere upstream on Suckerbrook? Paula, do you know? We do know from Emily and the work that's been done, I think with Pete Hazelton previously, maybe even with Jason Camignani, who's taken over from Pete Hazelton. We know that they're at least right below the dam. So, and I don't know if Joe knows anything further, but that's the last time I had heard. That's supposed to show you. It just seems that they hit a wall. Yeah, and that's as much as we know is that they're below the dam. The reason why I should say, the reason why they usually don't like to move them twice is it is a lot of stress on the animals. Um, and so moving them once is about as much stress as they want to put on them. And um, again, I I mean, I'm, I'm a fish and uh, stream guy, so I really rely on them, but that's really what they like to do. That being said, again, they do hope that they will move back up in a relatively short period of time geologically and muscle speaking, they hope, you know, in, within over the course of five, 10 years, move back up into the stream uh, through the means that you talked about in the larval stage and the gills of the fish. Um, but also we know that they're, we're gonna miss them too. We're hoping they don't get impacted because our, our objective is probably to have little to no um, loss of the dangerous species. That's, you know, obviously the objective, but um, we'll hopefully see some back pretty quickly. Thank Why you. don't you go ahead and stop sharing your screen for now, Joe? So we can see each other. <laughs> Sounds good. Oh, and we can. Is that okay? Uh, we still see your screen. Oh, we see your uh, owl. You guys got a lot of good pictures of my our shots of the owl this morning. All right, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So the, there were a couple other questions. Um, how do we volunteer for the removal? For example, debris removal. So I can answer that, but I also, um, you know, Michael and Paula, um, by all means, jump in here. I, we, as many people as we can have out there in safe working conditions, obviously with COVID and everything like that, the better. Um, I think contact Michael or Paula and uh, tell them you want to get out, and we'll be out there this summer um, doing it. I'll be out there with, um, with a few other DR staff getting our hands dirty. So um, let us know. I think uh, Michael or Paula, do you guys want to say which one better to contact? And, you can contact me and um, where's my contact information? Is that on the bottom of the slide? Did we include that? I wasn't sure, I couldn't remember. But I'm, you know, conservation administrator for the town of Pepperell. If you send me an email, I'll add you to the list and we'll make sure that we include you. Um, and most of you will see me around town. A lot of you that live around here, I see you pretty much every day. Uh, so, you know, just, just let me know and we will add you to the list. There's a lot of work to be done but it is volunteers um, that help to make these projects. I mean, everybody, the partners, the volunteers, this is how these things take place and happen. I think Michael Rosser was gonna say something too. Well, I just wanna say, yeah, not only will the dam be removed, but afterwards will probably be some restoration work. So if you do sign up, there could be some work to do, uh, probably with your skill level or maybe just physically. So there'll probably be something for you to do along the way. So you can get hold of Paula or go to our website at uh, Squanatistic TU. But uh, yeah, we'd love to see you out there. <laughs> now, I, have a, I have a question. So I'm curious to know for the American eel spawn. Well, the American eels actually come back in. Um, the American eels go out to the Sargasso Sea and then they come back in the streams. Um, they, when they come back in the streams, uh, they actually come back in as uh, glass eels when they work their way back in. So they spawn out in the ocean and then they come back in is smaller um, in the earlier stages of their life and then live in the streams for a while and then move back out. So does that answer your question? Right, I knew that eels did spawn in Sargasso Sea, but it's hard for me to imagine our American eel 
in the Nisitissa River going all the way to that Sargasso Sea to spawn and returning. I'm with you. I think it's amazing. It's fascinating. And the fact that they're getting all the way up into the Neshoba, uh, Nisitissa, then um, go up in the sucker is it's pretty amazing. So we're excited to see if they're there because, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. It's amazing. One well, other question, and then we'll have to stop. I think. Um, what are you looking for in the sediment testing? Oh, um, I will try and be as succinct as possible with this. But sediment testing, we look at um, is really the toxicity and the quality of the sediment. Um, we look at the green type and size, and um, just so we understand a little bit about the sediment and the palmet itself, and um, its ability to absorb different contaminants and stuff like that. But we overall, we look at um, a suite of chemicals and those chemicals, I would say really quickly, you know, your metals, lead, mercury, et cetera, um, PCBs, um, pesticides, um, as well as some other contamination uh, contaminants as well. But those are like the big ones. pH is another big one. Those are kind of the, the groups of uh, contaminants that we're looking at. And we compare those to human health as well as ecological thresholds. So your pack and stuff like that. Um, I can tell you more about it uh, if you want, but unfortunately, it'd probably take a little more time. That's great. Thank you so much. I think um, we're at 10.03, so we probably should, anybody have last questions? They can. Um, so somebody said they're curious about the fundraising component. Um, so anyway. I will give a quick to you on that real quick, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. And that's um, that important. Yeah. So thank you, Martha, um, for mentioning that. So TU is doing the local fundraising and they have been a critical partner um, to really get together dollars for the local match and stuff like that. So if you inter are interested in that component, whether it's giving money, giving time, or um, donating to your local TU chapter, I think that's the route to go. DR doesn't take local um, you know, to dollars. But if you really want to, Michael and those folks have done a great job uh, helping gather those funds. So please consider that and contact him. Michael, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> I'll echo that. Thank you so much, Joe and Paula. Um, that was great, Michael. Excellent presentation. Thanks, everyone. And, uh, stay tuned for April 27th for more muscles. <laughs> Thank right. you. Really appreciate it. Take care.